I think it takes a passion for a particular topic or uh, for the excitement of running your own project. I think there are certain people who crave the predictability of a steady job, and there are others who crave the excitement of running something that they control, that they you know, run, that they manage, that they lead. And so I think it does take a passion for wanting to, to manage something yourself, for wanting to run your own thing. I think we, we um, have the students learn about developing a business sensibility, which isn't necessarily always emphasized within journalism context. And that means thinking about not just the, the content opportunity, not just the specific content that people are producing, but the market for that content. And it also means thinking not just about the consumers and the readers and the so-called audience as the key constituency, but also thinking about businesses and the community at large as a constituency. So sometimes we can solve the problems of the communities at large in terms of their business needs as well as in terms of their content needs. And that's something that isn't always what we think about doing at traditional journalism schools. I think so. I think students should have an understanding of where the money comes from and, and how their industry works. All journalists should have that understanding because it's going to change and it's going to affect all of our careers, right? So any of us who have worked in the profession know that things change very quickly in journalism and as journalists we want to be prepared for that and as professionals we need to be prepared for that. Um, I think it helps us understand what the market needs are, so what audiences actually are interested in. It also helps us adapt and, and develop our own careers um, so that we're not stuck in a position where we face ourselves, you know, in the middle of our lives and kind of have nowhere to go. Um, if, we're, if, we're, if we're aware of what's going on, the, the market context, the business context, we often are able to adapt more nimbly than we might otherwise. Um, I don't think it really presents a fundamental challenge to your neutrality when you're aware of the state of the industry. Now, that's not to say that um, one should abandon all sort of principles that have traditionally governed what journalists do and don't do. And so you make decisions mindfully about how you're operating and what you're doing, and you're transparent about what your business relationships are and so forth. Um, but I think in this day and era, we just don't have the luxury anymore of ignoring that. Right? So if we do ultimately ignore the business side of things, as many journalists have traditionally, we'll continue to see the fate of traditional journalism organizations recede and the um, problems continue to fester and so forth. So in my, in my view, it's better to have something that's vibrant and alive and growing and thriving in a journalism organization that's, that's thriving um, than to have one that's fading because uh, no one's paying enough attention to the business side of the operation. I think increasingly you see sites that are both um, micro-local and micro-specific in terms of niches. So we talk, we talk in terms of um, geographic niches, psychographic and demographic niches. So in other words, niches that are based around a particular area, geographic area, psychographic meaning a particular topic area, subject matter, a specific type of sports for instance, or a particular type of hobby or health condition, um, as well as demographic, right? So based around a particular age group or cultural or ethnic group. So we talk generally in, in those kind of three buckets, um, de demographic, psychographic, and geographic um, niches. And I think increasingly what we see is that people aren't satisfied with just being segmented into one of those. But actually, for instance, I might be a cancer survivor in New York City. So it's not just a site for cancer survivors generally, but for those of us who live in New York City, for instance, as an example. Or um, there might be a site that's specifically aimed at people who are passionate about soccer, but they live in a particular city, right? Or, or they're in a particular age group, or they are in a particular ethnic or cultural group. I think that's a really important role that they play as validating an idea because there are a lot of ideas out there. And um, it's important to have the, the foundations play a role of validating ideas and giving a little bit of initial funding. The Knight Foundation has been tremendously um, valuable to a lot of startups. The Knight News Challenge has validated a lot of startups as, as an example that otherwise might have gone unrecognized. And that validation then gave them the credibility to go to market and say, here's, we've got a great product, we've got a great service. Um, 
whether that's something like Every Block, which you know eventually sold out, made a lot of money, and provided a much needed service for a lot of people with local news um, information, structured local news, um, and other projects like that, which have started out as um, Localocracy is another project which was recently acquired by the Huffington Post. Um, we worked with them at Pointer, um, and I think getting initial funding from Pointer and others was helpful for them as validation in the marketplace. Um, and they eventually were able to successfully um, sell their company. Um, so, so there are great examples where foundation funding leads to really great success for startups in, in the journalism world. Our ultimate goal is for people to be able to sustain their careers and manage these projects on the, in the long term, not just for a few years while they have some initial funding, right? So we recognize that in some cases, initial um, funding from foundations or donations can be helpful, but ultimately, even those foundations, even those who are giving donations, don't necessarily want to be sustaining those projects indefinitely. So one of the problems with relying strictly on foundations or nonprofit kinds of funding sources is that those sources can dry up. And we've seen this in the past where organizations that rely exclusively on that kind of funding are basically at the whim of those organizations in some cases, right? They ultimately um, can disappear if the, that funding disappears if they haven't diversified their funding and found other alternative revenue streams. So There's very little that is more enticing or more appetizing or more exciting for a recruiter than to talk to a student who has already built their own site, can make their own video, can run a social media campaign, can operate a project successfully independently. Um, employers love that. They want students who can do that. They will hire people um, simply for that ability, even if they um, may not need their, you know, all of their reporting and, and other skills because they've already got reporters. What they don't have is those with that entrepreneurial spirit, that fire in the belly, that desire to create something, to lead something, to run something, to manage something. So I think absolutely that's a very, very powerful credential for students to have.